Good afternoon and welcome. I would like to thank everyone for joining the lecture today. My name is Heather Canterbury. I'm a second year graduate student pursuing an MFA in studio art at UT. I am excited to be your host today. This is the second lecture of the semester for our Visiting Artist Lecture Series. Each fall, the second year studio graduate students collectively decide on three professional artists to bring to campus and interact with our undergraduate and graduate student bodies in the form of studio visits and a seminar. However, this year is not typical, so we invited our visiting artists to present a lecture and conduct studio visits with our graduates virtually. The Visiting Artist Committee would like to thank the Chair of the College of Fine Arts, Susan Rather, for making these visits possible. We would also like to thank Jill Velez, Hunter Thomas, Lauren McKnight, and Julie Schell for their organization and technical help. Please be advised that this lecture will be recorded for educational purposes and these recordings will be shared publicly through the department's social media platforms. Unauthorized recordings of this lecture material and the question and answer following is prohibited. Unauthorized recording is unethical and may also be a violation of university policy and state law. We invite you to ask questions during the lecture using the question and answer platform. Following the lecture, our Q&A moderator, Alex Pepin will present questions to our visiting artist as time allows. It is my pleasure to introduce Ilona Schwartz. Ilona Schwartz is a Polish American artist and photographer based in Los Angeles. She received an MFA in photography from Yale University and a BFA from the School of Visual Arts. Her recent solo exhibitions include Make Room in 2019, AALA Gallery Los Angeles 2018, Institute Photography Fort 2017, and Like a Gallery in 2016 Warsaw, um, America House Munich in 2015, The Foley Gallery in New York in 2013, and Gallery Claude Samuel Paris 2012. She has participated in group exhibitions at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Zagreb, Photographiska Museum, Stockholm, Shulamit Nazarian Gallery and Region Projects, Los Angeles, Danziger Gallery and International Center for Photography, New York, among others. Among her awards and grants, she has received the Richard Benson Prize for Excellence in Photography in 2015 and the Arnold Newman Prize for New Directions and Photographic Portraiture um, in 2014 and the World Press Photo Award in 2013. Her recent series, Unsex Me Here, is currently on view at the Benaki Museum in Athens, Greece. Her photographs have been featured in numerous publications worldwide. Informed by her experience moving from Warsaw, Poland to the small town of Canadian, Texas as a teenage girl, Schwartz's practice is rooted in the joint pressures of female adolescence and cultural assimilation. In her photographic series, I Am a Woman and I Cast No Shadow, Schwartz cast a white silicone mold of a model nearly identical to herself. Her doppelganger flashes expressions of alarm as Schwartz's hands press, pour, and cut away synthetic layers of flesh. Stretching out the process of becoming, Schwartz's subject never reaches a fixed identity. The artist simultaneously creates a mask that obscures her subject's face and a template that uncannily reproduces it. In each body of work, Schwartz unsettles the notion that such transformations exist only theatrically. Situated between photography and performance, portrait and self-portrait, the works consider what it takes to shape a self with all the moldings, omissions, transformations, and stylations involved. I am thrilled to give a warm virtual welcome to Ilona Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, for such a lovely introduction. 
Thank you, UT Austin, for having me. And special thanks to Dan and Bogdan um, for having me here today. Let me share my screen first. Um, so I'm going to present a few bodies of work uh, today that I hope will take you through my sort of trajectory over the past few years. Here's a little glimpse from my studio where I'm actually sitting in today as well. I would like to start by giving you a little bit more information on my background. I was born and raised in Warsaw, Poland, and I moved to the U.S. for the first time when I was in high school. And I lived in a small town in, um, in Texas Panhandle. The town was called Canadian, Texas. After that, I went back home for a few years, and then I moved to New York um, in 2008. And since then, I've been living in the U.S. Um, and I have been in Los Angeles now for about five years. So I'm going to start with this first body of work, uh, which is called American Girls. Um, I began working on that project, I think, pretty much immediately after I had moved to the U.S. Um, so this is a series of large format portraits of girls across the U.S who own American Girl dolls, which are customizable, customizable look-alike dolls. Um, for those of you who might not know the company, I will just give a little background. It was started, um, I think, in the late 80s um, by this woman who uh, yeah, created a few, a few different dolls. They are sized 18 inches and they um, resemble a body of an eight-year-old. And then in the 90s, Mattel, who also mm, is the manufacturer of Barbies, took over the company and they kind of took a different direction um, with the dolls and they introduced this um, series of dolls that is called Truly Me. And this is where really my interest lies in, in this particular se series of dolls. So basically, each girl can go into the store and create a doll that looks exactly like her. And after moving to New York, I was really interested at first in the street photography and I was kind of following the steps of all the great photographers of the 60s and documenting the streets of New York. Um, and I was kind of looking for an angle to sort of contribute to this, um, uh, to this history, but with, you know, through my own perspective. And I started noticing these girls walking around Midtown, you know, with matching outfits. And slowly I started doing research and finding out about these dolls and I found it really fascinating. So I began by just photographing and stopping these girls and their parents on the streets and kind of taking their portraits on the streets. But I quickly realized that that wasn't, that really didn't make that much sense. The portraits were rushed and it didn't really make sense to portray those girls on the sort of busy streets. So I decided to look for my subjects and ask them if I could go to their homes and uh, photograph them in their own rooms and with their own dolls and all the different accessories that they uh, would have. So that was a way for me to kind of, kind of open up this window to American culture for me and into the American homes even. So I was really interested in also like how Americans live and how is childhood sort of invented and staged, how are their, room, their, their rooms are arranged. So I started photographing in the tri-state area. Eventually, I also uh, made a trip to LA to photograph more, more girls here, not only Los Angeles, but all the kind of neighboring uh, cities and towns. And I did some portraits in Texas as well. Um, I think what I found really interesting at first about, uh, about this phenomenon and this subculture was the fact that the company named uh, their product American Girl. It seemed to me like they really defined and categorized little girls who were to become future American women. And that raises sort of important questions about who gets represented and how. It seemed to me also very exclusive, only for Americans and about Americans. And I also saw that as a sort of a marker of time, you know, like an iconic product um, that is also very specific of American culture. I feel like a lot of the culture here is built around an iconic product. Um, but in this case, an iconic product that sort of defines a generation. And that sort of, uh, that sort of inquiry was important to me because 
as I moved to, the, to, to New York and I was uh, in my early 20s, I was sort of, you know, thinking a lot about the fact how I grew up in a very different way, in a very different cultural context. And um, I was interested in to see how, like what are American women or young, young women, uh, what were they influenced by and how did they grow up and how was that different for me? So I took a stance of uh, sort of an outsider looking in. I was not, not a part of this group, so I was not a participant. It was also curious in terms of like the thinking of this sort of sculptural representation of girls um, to, to, to kind of examine what are the cultural values manifested through that product. How is individuality manifested? And specifically the fact that you can go into the store and kind of create your own version of yourself. I think psychologically that's also like really fascinating. At the time uh, when I was working on that, that body of work, which I think concluded in maybe 2012 or 13, the company was offering only like three different skin tones and most of them were based on a sort of Caucasian face. Uh, so there wasn't that much difference. I actually went on the website today and I saw that in 2017, I think they introduced like another four different skin tones. So it seems like they're becoming more and more inclusive. And uh, yeah, so there are three different skin tones. There was an abundance of choices that you could pick the hair for your doll and also different fashion and, uh, you know, clothing and fashion accessories. So in a way, when I looked at that and kind of analyzed that, it seemed like female identity is really constructed through the choice of hairstyle and color and fashion. So in a way, it was really curious to sort of look at this brand as it's and it's um and it's marketing that they're opening it up to sort of celebrate individuality but in reality it was almost like an erasure of individuality because everyone kind of ends up looking very similarly and the only way that you can distinguish yourself is through the hairstyle or fashion Another thing that was really interesting to me, and it's really kind of this image really speaks to it. So on the right here in this image, you can see a cutout of Justin Bieber. Um, this girl also, she chose a doll, a doll that looks uh, exactly like her mom. So that's also really kind of curious, uh, the choices that the little girls made. And this the whole was marketed to girls that were, I think, eight years old or older, which was also something very different uh, for me to sort of witness. Uh, I feel like growing up in Eastern Europe, I feel like all of us, like around the time we were six or seven, we were kind of ashamed to play with dolls anymore. And we kind of wanted to be like, you know, the older kids and teenagers. And I think you can kind of see the, the split in this image here too, where it's like on, on one hand, she's kind of connected to her mom and she's really tiny and still sort of in, in the midst of her childhood. This image was actually taken in San Diego. This one was taken in Temecula in California on a wine yard. I guess I was talking about the fact that a lot of the girls were much older playing with the dolls and I was kind of curious to see if that had any effect on them as they're growing up and shaping their identities. I think what surprised me about this phenomenon was that yes, the, the branding behind the doll was supposed to be kind of like pro-feminist and very progressive and distancing themselves from you know, Barbies and that sort of troubling body appearance. But then in many ways, there are so many inconsistencies with that because the girls, in the end, all they, I think, have been getting from these dolls is a perpetuation of traditional female gender roles and kind of a, a focus on body grooming and, you know, specifically the hair and the fashion. This image was taken um, in, uh, in New York. Um, and this, uh, this was a private Catholic school. There's gonna be another image that's gonna come up um, from, from that particular shoot. And what was interesting about this uh, particular school is that all the girls or the moms, uh, they decided to make identical uniforms for all of their dolls that match the, this you know, exact school's uniforms. Oh, and as we're getting closer to Halloween, this is a Halloween version for 
American Girl dolls. I should also mention that all of these portraits are taken with a large format camera. And this is the first time I worked with that camera. I pretty much maintain, uh, maintain that uh, medium for the, all of the other bodies of work that I'll be presenting here. Here you can kind of see also my interest in sort of the American domestic space. Uh, I was really sort of curious to kind of see how people in the U.S., how they arrange their living rooms, uh, the childhood bedrooms. I love the fact that here you can see in the, in the very front of the image, you know, kind of a marker of time. You can see Barack Obama. And going to the next image, you can kind of see how, how similarly this living room is arranged. And at the very front is a picture of this girl as a baby. And I, I love how it really mimics you know, her maternal pose with her doll. And then on the left, uh, I don't know if you can see, there's a World Trade Center image. So that's kind of, it's kind of curious how these rooms were very parallel. Oh, here's the image I, I was referencing. And I think it really makes the point that I was trying to, to make earlier about, you know, the erasure of individuality I think the only thing that really distinguishes those girls is maybe the hairstyles. Everything else is pretty much the same. Moving on to this next body of work. So um, once I was finished with that project, I was thinking a lot about my sort of responsibility as an artist and as a female artist um, that I have represented, you know, this, I, I created this archive of girls in the U.S. who play with those dolls. But then I also was aware of the fact that it's like, it's, uh, I'm presenting it through this very sort of consumer lens that they are all surrounded by, by this product. And I thought, you know, my, my responsibility was to kind of show a different, a different way, a different subculture in which girls in the U.S. Uh, are growing up and a different interest. And um, yeah, I've been making these trips back to Canadian Texas where I went to high school. And uh, this one trip I made, I stumbled upon this group of girls who were in the rodeo. So in my mind, this is almost like the second chapter to that first body of work, kind of showing a different angle to American girlhood. And in many ways, it was, it was, it was very interesting to work, work on it immediately after because I could make all these different uh, between those two different worlds. The rodeo girls, they were always outside. They were always training. They were very athletic. Um, their bodies were really active. They were dominating the animals a lot of the time. The, they, they valued strength and speed and risk. And that was kind of jarring to compare it to all the girls that I photographed in their homes with dolls who were mostly sort of sedentary and kind of really focused on body grooming. were mostly, um, it's almost seemed like the femininity was transferred onto the animals. They were focused on sort of pampering the animals and, you know, combing their manes and giving them vitamins and, and brushing the horses and caring for the horses. You can kind of see here the point I was making about how their bodies are very active, how they, you know, dominate the animals, how they're physically really strong. This girl, she's practicing the rodeo competitions, which is called goat tying. And it involves basically getting on your horse, running into the arena, and then jumping off the horse, catching the goat, and tying three legs of the goat. So she is here practicing on her wrench. For the most part, I photographed these girls. I found them going to rodeo competitions and they would introduce me to their friends and their competitors. Um, but sometimes I would also travel to the places where they live. And this, I think this image is kind of interesting to think in relationship to the one that I pointed out with a Justin Bieber cutout. It was really curious for me to kind of see how they're shaping their identities in this sort of uh, traditionally, you know, male, dominant arena like the rodeo and you know here she has a john wayne 
cut out and kind of thinking about like who is the male archetype in that world to think about the fact that this is you know an older man an actor kind of an iconic hollywood figure and not someone you know contemporary to this girl's age or culture of the time And uh, these girls also, you know, when you look at their attire, it follows a male fashion system, sort of. I mean, obviously, all of these, um, all of the things that they wear have some sort of a utility in the rodeo world. The boots, you know, jeans to protect them, the hats to protect them from the sun. The only thing that these girls would do, and usually this is where the moms or the grand grandmothers would step in, they would like bedaz bedazzle their shirts and, um, you know, make it a little bit more sparkly. Uh, and that would be the only thing that really distinguished them from boys. So for a lot of these girls and their families, this is a lifestyle. So they would be traveling for a good part of the year from a rodeo competition to another rodeo competition. The girls compete outside of boys and uh, the parents often compete as well. Some of them would own up to eight different horses uh, and each horse would be trained for a very particular competition in the rodeo. Some of them would start as early as the parents would tell me as early as two or like as soon as the kid is able to sit down, they would put, you know, they would put them on a horse and kind of have the baby uh, get used to the, the movements of the horse. And so that's quite, quite interesting way of, yeah, quite interesting lifestyle. So I traveled, for the most part, the photographs are taken in Texas uh, for the bigger part, but I have also traveled to Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Colorado to take a few of these. So in ways how American girls were all about sort of the interior American domestic space. I wanted these photographs to really celebrate, um, you know, the American landscape as well as the portraits, as well as, as, well as their unique, unique faces and features and intricacies of their lifestyle. This girl, her parents own bucking bulls. And so this is one of their, what they would refer to as a celebrity bucking bull and his name was Poker Face. This is sort of an apparatus to have the horses exercise, I guess, or get their, get their steps in. <laughs> Oh yeah, earlier on I mentioned, and I feel like this photograph really illustrates this idea, the idea of the transferring of the femininity onto, onto the animals. You can see how perfectly braided uh, the horse's mane here is, and also how amazing and disheveled hair, uh, her hair is, and how she doesn't really care about that. And the little detail of her painted nails is quite lovely too. This was, uh, this was taken right outside this town called Happy, Texas. Okay, I guess that was the last one from the series. So I'm gonna move on to the next body of work, which is a triptych. And um, so, this body of work um, 
is structured as a makeup tutorial. So the beginning image, what you're looking at right now is the sort of before picture. And then I begin with the transformation of this model. And um, I begin applying makeup to her face and transforming it into different characters. Um, but that body of work began with an idea to organize a casting call for my doppelgangers, for American women who I believe look a lot like me. And um, that kind of came out straight out of, out of these two bodies of work, uh, American Girls and Rodeo Girls. I was thinking a lot about the fact that I was sort of defining myself by who I am not. I was not a participant in this, these worlds. I was, you know, an outsider looking in. I they were typologies that were sort of uh, previously organized by, I guess, society and identity. You know, they were part of subcultures that I've just documented. And I wanted to sort of invert that process and look a little bit more closely at myself. So I thought about doing this casting call for my doppelgangers to create my own typology. My experience living in the US and being an immigrant uh, for many years, I've realized many years in that there have been several things that I have done to my uh, to my looks, to, uh, to, you know, on the outside and on the inside, several transformations that I have led myself through mostly, I guess, in my appearance and body language to make myself kind of imperceptible, to, to have a passing as a white American woman on the street, I guess. The moment I start, I start speaking, people can hear my accent and my identity is revealed. So I kind of have to go over my biography pretty much every time I have like the smallest even conversation at the grocery store with anyone or, or really anyone anywhere on the street. Um, so I started to think about that and how could I channel this experience of mine into a photographic series. And this is where I sort of landed on this form of the makeup tutorial. I thought like that showing uh, so many stages of becoming, uh, even though they might be small from one to another, is really important and kind of stretching that process of becoming. It really is not really important for me that the, the character becomes something really specific, but really the sequence of her transform being transformed uh, is quite important to me. So here I also, I am in the photograph. So when you see, you see me and you see my hands, I assume the role of the expert. Also, having, gro having grown up in Europe in the 90s, uh, all the TV back then, there was, there was so many makeover TV series. So I was really interested in also the role of the expert and how uh, the expert kind of maneuvers their subjects and how you know, they have the authority of telling these different women, you know, do not wear this or you need to do your, do your makeup this way or another way. Um, so that was really curious for me as well in terms of even the power dynamics what does it mean for me as an immigrant to make all these marks and transform this american woman into a different character and i thought in many ways to me the meaning of that was sort of a reversal of my cultural assimilation onto her so in this particular in this particular sequence, I am aging her. So I started also collecting vintage books on stage makeup tutorials. So these are these photographs are based on on some of the tutorials that I've uh, some yeah some of the instructional photographs that I've seen in those books, and this idea of also exploring the instructional image, the image that was supposed to only have a utilitarian purpose was really interesting to me as well and using that that as a vessel and pushing it into the realm of of an art image so it was really important to me to find these women that look a lot like me to uh, project my consciousness onto them and easily manipulate them as if they were me so in that way i treat myself as a subject and the object and i am also in control of the gaze so that sort of triangulation was really, really important to me. And also to bring out the sort of the foreign and the familiar uh, simultaneously. It was, it was curious for me to kind of ask this question of how identity, how appearance is connected or disconnected from identity. And I also wanted to sort of push on the outer limits of portraiture and self-portraiture. I was hoping 
the viewer will be constantly confused whether you know I am the subject or the object or whether we're one person, whether it's an internal it's sort of like an internal dialogue that is being kind of played out. But also another thing that was really interesting to me too is to kind of bring in my other interests in art, painting, performance, film. I moved away from, you know, the other two bodies of work were uh, serial. There was like one, one portrait, one, one picture per, per, per person. And this every time, this is a sequence, um, almost like a filmic sequence that sort of, there's small changes from one to the other. And also this idea of, um, you can see I'm kind of like drawing on her face here, Earlier on, I was making a little bit more like painterly marks. Um, oh, wrong direction. Can you, how can you make a mark in a photograph without actually physically manipulating a print? Each one of these transformations follows the narrative of the first picture is the before picture, then I begin the transformation. And then towards the end of each sequence, I kind of stage these behind the scenes images where I even further construct them. So in the narrative of a makeup tutorial, that would be a picture where I would be showing like, oh, this is how a makeup artist is supposed to organize, I don't know, their palette, their studio, uh, their working space, um, but for me, that's an opportunity to even further create this uncanny portrait of the two of us. And I forgot to mention earlier on that all of the little details are really coded with meaning in, in this body of work. So here I'm using this traditional Polish scarf um, and I'm making her into this, you know, sort of old baboshka type of character. And uh, earlier on the tea towel that I was using on her, it said um, Polski Len, which means Polish linen. And it's like a really iconic um, sort of piece of fabric that you would see in everyone's homes in the 80s and 90s back home in Poland. So this is the second part of the triptych. I am a woman and I play the horror of my flesh. And again, I'm sort of beginning with this image of um, the before image, before the transformation begin. And in, in the narrative sense, my thinking was the, actor, the actress has just arrived in the studio, they're taking her picture, and the kind of perverse tutorial begins. I kind of move on here to showing the artist's hand, and again, kind of thinking of mark making. And by the slight shift of focus, the marks become almost like a wound. I wanted the background to look like something of like an inside of the body or bodily fluids. And this one's a little bit more playful. Again, I'm using, you can see whatever she's covered, her shoulders are covered with. It's again, it's something I picked up when on one of my travels back home, something that was stitched by someone by hand. And you'll see a little bit later as I'm, uh, as I'm making more marks on her face, how that had this thing laying in my studio for forever. And then once I start working on this, I thought the, the threads are almost like the drawing, another way of mark making. And a lot of these books that I was basing uh, this imagery from the vintage makeup tutorial books. Usually the, the makeup artist would be uh, a man. So it was also interesting for me to embody that and see once the roles are reversed, what happens with who is an active body, who is a passive body. A lot of these men in the photographs, you could see how the women would be almost like props. You know, they would put, put their hands on their heads and brushes and things that usually are should be very soft and almost create a caressing touch to the face. They would be pointy and quite violent. So I wanted to kind of replay that as well.
So all the little details here in the photographs, you can see sort of on my hand, like the little inflamed cuticle that would be also painted in. I was hoping that through these little gestures, I could have the viewer think a little bit more about who these characters would be. So this tutorial, I, what I'm trying to get at is like a bigger version of herself. And it sort of culminates with this sweaty <laughs> image. And you can see I'm sort of using the traditional Polish fabrics again here on her. And the triptych culminates with this sequence, I am a woman and I cast no shadow. So again, I begin with this before picture. And here in these pseudoscientific ways, I am thinking of almost like measuring her, trying to figure out, you know, how is she different from me? These photographs specifically with the tape measure are based on photographs that I saw that show you how to measure the head for a, a wig. And I'm also using centimeter instead of inches here to kind of point back to, to my culture. And in each body of work, I guess I forgot to mention that earlier, I'm trying to sort of connect them a little bit. So if you see here, the shirt that I'm wearing kind of mimics the backdrop that I had in the second series. So I'm trying to sort of tie it narratively. Here the shirt almost um, as I spread my arms, it kind of becomes the backdrop again. So again, it points to the previous sequence. And in this particular transformation, what I'm doing is I'm going to be casting her face in silicone. So in my thinking about that was um, to sort of put myself through this experiment in reproduction to produce another face of my own and of our type. So again, kind of pointing to this idea of typologies that I have been dealing with in the two other bodies of work. And here, I guess I'm really thinking about flesh becoming my form. I'm sort of cutting in and readjusting this synthetic flesh. preparing her for the pouring of the silicone. Yeah, and I guess the, the three sequences here really, I really wanted to bring in sort of my other interests in painting and sculpture. Like this is a, you know, a, a process that a lot of sculptors use performance, creation of a performance, a filmic sequence. And just sort of taking off the mask, the rebirth. And again here, I guess I'm pointing back to my culture with that again, and specifically sort of the, the Catholic is so prevalent in my culture. Um, so the mask here looks almost like the Shroud of Turin or a Vera icon. Really my interest in working with silicone and mold making began with this body of work. It's an interesting phenomenon here that happens when you look at the nose, the nose is actually protruding away for, from the camera, but with manipulation of light, um, you can make it look as if it's coming towards the camera.
And I end this body of this body of work with this image, this sort of Janus figure, the Roman god of transitions, the two-faced god of transitions. And I think of that as kind of looking at myself, at my sort of future and past at the same time. And this, this body of work became a book. Um, so the book takes the form of uh, like a brochure or a magazine, maybe like a fashion magazine or some sort of women's magazine. So the front covers on the left that you can see is the three sort of before pictures, almost like headshots. And the back covers are the after. So you flip through before and after and everything in between kind of the procedure. I wanted to share with you as well how I present this work. So each body, each sequence is 24 images and that kind of presents its own challenges with kind of exhibiting that amount of photographs. And in that way, they read really well in a book because you can flip through all the different stages of the makeup. So here in this show that I had in 2016, I decided to create the space of the gallery. Think about the space of the gallery this way, that the left you can see the three before images and on the right you can see the actual masks that I made in the process of making this body of work. And then once you enter the gallery, you see sort of the transformations. The, the Yes, it's almost like a procedure room. And the way I've gone about it is to sort of create these sequences from each one of the series and present them almost like film strips. Unsex me here. So this body of work, it is also a makeup tutorial of sorts. I wanted to sort of combine the two interests of mine of working in the studio and then outside of the studio. So I am kind of staging this narrative here of this woman who's alone in her house. This was shot in Palm Springs. This is a house that has been perfectly preserved from 1969. And it is in the style of Hollywood Regency. And that kind of interests me for many different reasons. First of all, it's like from the golden era of Hollywood. From the 20s, the famous actresses and actors, they, this is how they would stage their homes. And they were known for this sort of excessive, you know, decoration and over, overly, overtly feminine, flowery, decor. So it was interesting to me to kind of stage this narrative in this particular house. The idea for this came from uh, several different angles. I had this memory from my childhood when I was bitten by a dog and I've always wanted to make some like a body of work that would kind of connect to that. Um, but then also sort of my research further in the makeup tutorial world kind of led me to other places. Um, I've started looking at YouTube a lot because it seems like the idea of the expert was really from the 90s. You know, these days it seems like for the most part women are doing makeup in their own bedrooms or young women specifically and posting it on YouTube and they are doing it willingly. Um, they, there, there is no expert involved and they kind of play the role of their own expert. And so I wanted to remove myself from that position in the photograph. I kind of go back to being sort of a doc documentarian and going back to this first image, if you see the detail in the mirror on the right, I'm reflected there with my large format camera. Yes, so basically I am staging this narrative where this woman is along this crazy house with her dog and she is starting to apply her makeup and she is leading herself through this abject transformation. And it was important to me that the transformations that are happening here, that the backdrop for them is this overtly feminine sort of house and decor. Oh yeah, about the makeup tutorials, I, uh, the YouTube makeup tutorials. I forgot to mention that uh, once I started looking into it um, and sort of following a lot of the different trends within that particular subculture. I have been also noticing that a lot of women would paint their own puppies on their faces. And then the last image would be they would pose with their dogs next to sort of their own image as their puppy. So I thought it was kind of curious. And so all of these different angles crystallized for me in this body of work. There's another body of work that I'm not showing here sort of for narrative purposes, 
but there's another sequence that I've made a year prior to this, which was a sequence of five mural sized photographs of a close up of this woman's face. And I staged a narrative in her eye. But really what was important once I had a show in 2018 and showed this body of work was that because the close-ups of, of her face were so large, people would see, would see her skin and would see the makeup, how the makeup sits on her skin and how her, like, I guess you could call it peach fuzz or small hairs on her face. And it seems like viewers were really confused about her gender and like really, really like paid attention to, to the texture of her skin. And I was sort of that also got me thinking a lot about hair and how, and how that has been a taboo for women for, for, for so long. So I found it quite liberating that this character is kind of excessively adding this hair and this sort of flexible boundary between a woman and a beast was, was really curious to me too. So this is, I present these as a triptych. This uh, sort of functions a little bit more as like an establishing shot almost before everything happens. And then again, some images that are based again on, on instructional images from makeup, vintage makeup tutorial books, sort of showing the tools that you, you'd be needing to use if you had wanted to make this transformation. So the title of the show comes from Lady Macbeth. It comes from her monologue where she pleads to the spirit to get rid of her feminine qualities, to almost like uh, decontaminate her sex, to get rid of her excessive femininity so that she could do the deeds that she needed to do, that she wanted her husband to do, but, but I guess she was trying to take matters into her own hands. So that was interesting to me, this concept of sort of the move away from the human. I think in my, the process of me culturally assimilating speech has been the one, the one place that reveals my identity. And I think that idea of transcending downwards to the pre-human, pre-verbal stage was really, really interesting to me to explore here. And I use this, so if you can see here, the eyeshadow has also like a dog or beast-like shape on it. So I use this repetition of sort of the dog imagery as, as a way of sort of world building. Here's the kind of the inverse of the mask. And here's her final hybrid stage. And then I conclude this image with this sort of self-portrait as the documentarian in the, in the role of the documentarian. And you can kind of see all the different props that I had set up for her makeup table. And this is uh, from my show here at Make Room in Los Angeles from last year. I'll show you how the gallery was structured. So here on the left, if you can see behind the two green images, there's another smaller gallery. And in that gallery, I created an installation. Um, so I recreated the wallpaper from the house. I brought in a chandelier, the exact same one that was in the pictures in that particular Palm Springs house. 
there is we carpeted the area so i was hoping that the viewer could kind of come in and kind of feel like the oppressive sort of sickly decor of that house and also walk on something soft and really like embody that, that space so the, the kind of the distance from just looking at a framed photograph to actually imagining that space collapsed and i'm working here on the floor for the second time actually with cultural item i wanted to sort of deconstruct that vanity mirror and all the and show all the props that have been used in the series i feel like in that way this really connects like to the core of my work which is really about like showing the process and revealing my process and showing the props okay and this is the last body of work that i'm going to share with you today this is from this year it's called virgin soap so again, I'm thinking about this idea of a sequence and a tutorial. And again, sort of going down the rabbit hole of YouTube, I have come across several YouTube tutorials that were hosted by male sculptors who would have models come in and they would be making the impressions of their breasts. So I wanted to embody that and work with that idea and bring in the silicone again and work with that again. I decided to set up the space as almost like an artist or like a painter's atelier. I based it off one of pictures of Matisse's studio. Oh, here you can also see the wallpaper in the background. I made the wallpaper and I sourced it from the colorful couch, uh, the heavily patterned couch from the Palm Springs house. So I'm hoping to kind of, again, sort of have these moments of connections between the different bodies of work and I settled on this sort of color a scheme of green and blue also point to the film industry and kind of the green screen and the blue screens uh, the model in the picture is here she's a Russian immigrant so again I'm kind of her experience although slightly different than my own I, she becomes my kind of imperfect double this technique that I'm showing here I'm kind of using again this idea of measuring but this this is specifically taken from these other uh, youtube tutorials that i found that are by plastic surgeons and this is called a shoelace technique that you use for correcting a misplaced breast implant and here sort of the perverse tutorial begins Oh, you can see some of the images here in my studio. I'm still in the process of finalizing my installation. For the purpose of the PDF, I split this up, but this would have been a sequence of um, seven images. So you can see on the left, starting with putting Vaseline and then the silicone, slowly applying more and more of it. So again, kind of thinking about the sculptor's process and really showing the intricacies of that, but also exploring it photographically. This is another stage to fortify the silicone by applying burlap to make it a stronger substance before you add plaster. And I wanted specifically for the model to be posed very classically as if almost like modeling her on Manet's Olympia or Titian's Venus of Orbino. Oh, here you can see this, sort of the inside of the mold again. In the process, I am actually creating this silicone sculpture, which you'll see in just a second. Here again, um, pointing back to the other body of work to unsex me here, I'm bringing in those mid-century vases and kind of creating this still life, this very painterly still life. That was part of the set. Yes, and it concludes with, with this image, this sort of abject third body 
that is left, the third perfect body that is left there once the two of us left the frame. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we do have a few questions and Amazing. Um, a few minutes to move through them. One of them was um, maybe more related to the body of works you showed at the beginning, but still I find might relate to the later work that you showed. How do you choose the surroundings that will be part of um, a photograph and um, in terms of setting. So what does the setting up and posing of the picture look like when you work with models? Uh, how much do you direct and how much is coming from the subject as well? What's the process maybe? Yes, the process. So for American Girls and Rodeo Girls, I, the way I found my subjects is, at first I mentioned I was trying to find my subjects on the street, but I felt like that didn't really work out. So I started looking online for um, like fan pages, Facebook groups, where these girls would be a part of and just say, I'm an artist, I'm working on this body of work. If you own a lookalike doll like this and would like to be a part of this, contact me. And from there, I would have them, usually their parents would reach out to me. I would ask for a few pictures of the girls with their dolls and maybe the few pictures of the room. And usually in that moment where I got the few pictures, I would be like, the, there was like a single detail that would be interesting to me. And I would kind of, you know, remember that and kind of jump off from, from that starting point. And then the way I worked is I would usually make an appointment, go there usually on the weekends I uh, spent the day with the family. Um, at that time, I think I also, I was doing like a little bit of video interviews, sometimes just with the girls, sometimes with their parents as well. So I would try to like just learn about them and the family and what was important to them, look around the house, see what is visually interesting to me and what also connects to the story. For that body of work, because it was more, almost like more documentary and kind of anthropological in nature, I also had constructed these questionnaires that the girls would answer. So I guess by just gathering all the information and also then just visually what was curious to me, what felt um, like something I've never seen before, like the two photographs that I pointed out about um, the living rooms that were arranged with the pictures, you know, that's something like I've never seen before. So yeah, just kind of organically and intuitively following these leads. All right, we have another question that sort of moved in that direction. So how do you discuss your work with the guardians of the child subject? Or, and, and, and maybe more interestingly, how do you position your critical inquiry and how do you uh, present it to the, the subject that's getting photographed? And is there a negotiation that happens between maybe the expectation of the person being photographed and um, your critical thinking? Um, you know, I think the answer is like with full transparency. I think I approached it saying, you know, this is what I'm doing. Uh, I'm an artist. This is not going to look like a commercial image. I'm not photographing the girl smiling. My references are more like classical painting. So I would just lay all of that up front and whoever, you know, might have not wanted to participate, they would just drop out before I would even probably meet them. I can't really remember any of the situations or if there was, a, there was ever a point of contention. You know, once I had a few images that I really liked and knew that they were going to become part of the series, I would also show the parents like, this is where I'm going with this. This is, these are the examples of the work. We uh, have somebody asking, um, I'm just going to read the question, but um, your work is uh, rich with personal narrative and experience. What kind of advice do you have for students who draw on inspiration from their lives, but have life experiences that may be alien to a reviewer or a juror? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I truly believe that it's impossible to make work that is not your own. It, it's, it's impossible to just bury yourself somewhere, you know, deep and really not talk about your own experience. So I think just speak your truth. <laughs> and the more specific, the more relatable probably it's going to be. 
Thank you. We had a question that had to do more with the project, with the setting of the project that involved like the 60s house or yes. this very uh, interesting space with the transformation into um, hairy sort of creature, werewolf person. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot the name of the... No, the that's the, perfect. Um, yeah, unsex, unsex me here, right? Was that the... Okay, so the question is, uh, how did you gain access to the, you know, this like perfectly preserved home? Um, and are you preparing uh, color scheme, clothing patterns prior to finding a space or, uh, or adjusting your preparation according to the space you were uh, able to find? And in other words, like how much did the final location space have in the outcome of the work as it appears that the space was kind of utilized as is or found? Well, there's a lot of preparation that I do. This body of work was very detailed, really scripted beforehand. I've actually approached making that body of work a couple years prior, and I shot it in this Bel Air house that used to belong to Clark Gable. But honestly, I was not happy with the results, so I just kind of put it aside, and then I was like, I'm just going to start over. But the way I work is I usually start by making Google Doc or a PDF where I put it on all my different references, all the different readings that I'm doing, and I start compiling it. After moving to LA, I start working, sort of expanding my crew. So I've been working with different people who I would bring on board and they would help me finesse all the details. Um, but that house, I honestly, I was recovering from surgery and I was watching Netflix and I saw that house on, like on Netflix for the first time. And I thought it was pretty amazing and impressive. And then I found the owners on LinkedIn <laughs> and I talked them into um, letting me shoot there. They are a couple who have, they're actually from Texas, actually. I think they're from Amarillo might be, or maybe one of them is from Amarillo. So they have a production house and they make documentaries and this is their vacation home. Um, and they were very gracious to let me in there and photograph in there. But yeah, to talk about the color scheme, everything has been decided beforehand. Absolutely everything to the smallest details. Yes. So we have a question um, that, uh, so somebody says that they're curious about um, your choice of large format in the history of photography and would like you to elaborate on that um, and connected to this question. Um, they were reminded of funeral rituals that involve embalming uh, that seem to run from dolls to silicone to to make up series can you comment on this as a way of thinking uh, of liveness and death in photography uh, that was so central uh, to its theorizing for decades i really love that i really love that comment and thank you thank you for that comment and that's definitely in my mind um, there was one thing, I think uh, when I was going through the first makeup transformation, I am a woman and I feast on memory, the one where I'm making her into an older woman. I think I was so concerned with giving you kind of like a conceptual background for the whole work that I think I might have missed on some of the nuances on each individual picture. But there's one picture in there where I specifically thought about corpse as a character. And there's, I don't know if any one of you can pull that image in your mind again she's leaning her head back a little bit and her mouth is open and we kind of painted like a chip tooth and with like all the sort of uh, dark circles and all the sh contouring and sh shadow the gray paint on her face i really thought of her uh, looking as a corpse and that is i mean that is definitely an interest of mine and i can see how the dolls and the silicone and all of that kind of feeds into this narrative. There's another body of work that was an editorial piece that I've done a couple years ago that was specifically about funeral homes in uh, here. So yes, I think I'm definitely feeding off of that narrative and that history of photography. And also even thinking about how um, portraits were taken like um, turn of the century with, you know, with like the clamps on the heads uh, because of the long exposure times. I think all of that is really, yes, evident in my work as well. I think about that a lot. I mean, another thing that I have been, so I've been collecting the books on, you know, vintage stage makeup tutorials and also different, I look at different types of medical imagery and I sometimes use some of the poses 
interchangingly sort of were like I combined the two. I was really, uh, back at Yale, we were introduced to um, this library of, of brains. There was this doctor named Harvey Cushing, um, who was a brain surgeon. And on top of his medical career, he was also an artist and an avid photographer. And I think once I saw that library, I was also really interested in sort of this bizarre medical imagery from like the early 19 hundreds or like the 20s or 30s. I think this was around the time when he was working. So that definitely has made it into my work as well. I did forget the very beginning of the question that was about large formats. I don't know if you want to read that. I don't know if I covered that. Yes. Uh, so it was, I was curious about your choice of large format in the history of photography. Uh, if you just could elaborate on, on that. And I think the, the, the better, yeah, the juicy part of the question yeah. that you answered. Yeah, to speak about the large format, um, I, think, I think my initial decision to use the large format camera, which started with American Girls, was about the fact that I decided to go to their homes. And I thought there was going to be so much detail that will be beautifully rendered with the large format film and color as well that yeah I just made that choice I was also thinking a lot about like children's performance for the camera which is often really humorous and funny and I really wanted to make a different kind of image and I thought that would also be a way to slow the children down introduce them to a different type of process but then in a way like I've worked with it for so many years that now it's really like my camera of choice I think the, the obstacles that it gives me and the amount, how much it slows me down and how it makes me consider each frame, I think that is helpful for me, for my work. All right. We still have time for like maybe two more questions. Uh, your photos are really about a sense of classical femininity sometimes. And so uh, this person is interested in where gender becomes more fuzzy or, or nuanced, like, like maybe the more tomboy <laughs> ranch girl photo and the braided horse hair and some of the tutorials also that might complicate that notion. So can you talk about the moments when you start, when the photographs take you away or your subject take you away from the classical femininity? You know, I think um, the, my choice to proceed with this body of work of rodeo girls was to specifically speak to that. I felt like American girls were all about this really classical, traditional female roles, perpetuating domesticity at that time. I'm not sure. I think, you know, it's been a few years. So I'm sure this company has kind of probably updated their profile or what they offer to girls. But at the time there weren't very gender neutral options for clothing for these girls. It was really just very classical or traditional yeah femininity that they were portraying so i think it was refreshing for me to see this other group of girls and it was important therefore to document them and include them in this archive of girls that live in the u.s right now but i think in the series maybe the third sequence of the makeup where i pour the silicone over her face there are moments where the genders are kind of blurred where you cannot really tell whether she's a female or a male. Um, you can't really tell the gender of the model, I think in some images. And then I also take it to, to an extreme with unsex me here. This is just like a creature, this uh, sort of hybrid between human, beast, werewolf, the outrageous long hairs and yeah. All right, um, and we had a question that is very broad, but uh, what is there a specific reading material or some kind of um, maybe like textual influence, like a, like an inspiration you had from a text you read that informed uh, your current or had informed the past body of work? Like anything you could share with the students that was influential? Yeah, um, actually, yes. I always work with texts. I guess um, overall, I've been really influenced by the writings of Gilles Deleuze. And I think all the transformations and the sort of the notions of becoming girl, becoming woman, becoming, becoming animal, becoming imperceptible. I feel like each sort of chapter or like each body of work becomes this other chapter that comes from his writing as well. 
and some um, some sort of yeah my interpretation of that. Um, the one body of work that I haven't shown here because I feel like it's really difficult to show in a PDF and specifically on Zoom was heavily influenced by the writer of Angela Carter, um, who's a, an English feminist writer whose project was to sort of uh, rewrite European fairy tales through this dark psychological, psychoanalytical and feminist lens. And this is also where the werewolf narratives kind of entered my work. For Unsex Me Here, I worked with the text, the monologue of Lady Macbeth, and also a little bit with uh, this novel by Juna, Knight, uh, by Juna Barnes. The book is called Nightwood, which is an amazing piece of writing. It has, I really, the, the one thing I specifically connected in that book to my body of work and my own experience as a child being bitten by a dog was that sort of the final scene of the book is that the protagonist kind of falls to the floor and something like really strange is happening and She's starting to mimic the dog. She's running around on all fours. And I felt like she, not unlike my character, transcends to this like pre-human, pre-verbal stage. And then uh, the latest body of work, um, the title co comes from this poem by Charles Simic, a Serbian American poet. The poem is called Breasts and it comes from the selected book of poems from 1963 to 83. And then I also worked with another text, which is called The Breast by Philip Roth, in which the protagonist becomes a 155 pound breast and quite surreal things are happening to him. Um, so yes, so for sure, there's always, there's always a lot of literature that is behind the work. Sometimes it's a little bit more, the translation of the ideas into literature is a little bit more one-to-one -one, and sometimes it's a little bit more abstracted. Thank you very much about, it was a very generous talk and very generous answers as well. I think this should be uh, the end of it, given the time, um, and, but thank you. And Thank you so much for your time, Ilona. We really appreciate you being here and how generous you've been with your time and answering questions. That was absolutely wonderful. So thank you again. Well, thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. And thank you to, for, to everyone that's been watching. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we would have a big um, round of applause, but um, oh, yeah, this format you. doesn't permit it. But um, <laughs> see, you, see you soon. Thank you very, very much. Right. Thank you.